Hi everyone, I'm Gabriel Pereira. I am your host of A Modern Animal. In this podcast, myself and my friend, Dr. Mike Woodrow, will be digging into all things related to the life of a modern animal. Cats, dogs, horses, and the occasional fish, we will cover it all. Building on Mike's more than 35 years of experience as a veterinary surgeon in Australian country practice, uh, suburban practice, and more recently as the owner of businesses across the pet care space. Hey everyone, welcome back to episode nine of a Modern Animal Podcast. This episode, we have Dr. Danny Houlihan. Welcome, Danny. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. It's great to have you on the show. I just want to give the the listeners and the viewers, I guess, a little bit of a bio for you. And I've got it in front of me. So give me two seconds. So you graduated from Murdoch in 2007 with honors in veterinary medicine. Um, You've worked in busy general animal practices in Sydney, Australia and Portland, Oregon. That's interesting. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Before moving and completing a dermatology internship in Perth. And then you're in University of California um, at the teaching hospital there as a resident. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, one of the um, best times of my life at the University of California. It was amazing. What a wonderful location. Couldn't ask for better. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> Perth's not too bad either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you completed the residence in 20, 2013, um, joined the American College of Veterinary Dermatology in the same year, and now you're the founder of Veterinary Dermatology Clinic, so a very specialist focus building on that experience, both at the University of Cal and, and your residency, of course. Um, What I found most interesting, though, is that you are a pet parent to Spike, Daisy and Oliver. So you've got a trio of labs. Is that right? (laughs) That's right. Um, Ghost. Now, Leoki, Likoi, I'm getting that wrong or right? I'm not sure. Yeah, so it's Likoi. So um, Yeah, they're also known as a werewolf cat. So they look like little werewolves. Oh, I think I've seen them. Okay. Um, And Hobbs, who is who is. Last and by no means least, a domestic short hair cat. Yes, and we now also have Fuzzy, who is a domestic <laughs> medium hair cat. I am not a hoarder, I promise. <laughs> and you clearly don't like animals. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Fortunately, I have a very tolerant husband who allows nice. me to um, have a huge house full of pets. Love it. I love it. Um, obviously, that keeps you really busy. But let, today we're here to talk about specifically your practice in skin and coat health for dogs and cats. Um and I know just looking at your bio and, and sort of wandering around Google, looking at your expertise, I'm so thrilled to have you on the on the show. One of our most topical areas in terms of considerations and questions we get from pet parents is, is skin and coat health, of course. Um, what what do you see in practice? I mean, we, we see probably, I guess you'd call it more the consumer end of town, so the itchy skin, the shedding, the hair loss, the hairballs, that sort of thing. I guess you're seeing a lot of different stuff in practice. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think in general practice, uh, one of the most common reasons that pets will come in to see a vet is because of a skin or ear concern. So most commonly, um, we can see ear infections. And most commonly with skin disease, we see pets presenting with some sort of itchy behavior. So ways that pets might manifest itch, they can lick, chew, bite, scratch or rub various parts of their body. Um, And with those behaviours, they can also develop secondary infections, which become quite problematic as well. Of course. And and are people coming to see you straight away or is it only after they've tried certain things at home and, you know, finally finally got worried about the pet? Yeah, so it's quite interesting. Um, Most people will try multiple home remedies before seeking veterinary attention. So they'll try some sort of cream or lotion or potion um, that they have at home or something that they've purchased from the pet store. Um, And when that's not effective, they'll usually seek veterinary attention. Um, And it's quite interesting too, because some people don't perceive things like licking the paws to be abnormal. Um, I commonly hear feedback from our clients that the paw licking is behavioral or anxiety. Um, That's actually actually really uncommonly the case usually yep. these pets are licking their paws because they're itchy got it and they're just trying to they're just trying to get some relief absolutely so what do you look for i guess so let, let's flip it on its head so how do you recognize a healthy skin and coat what are the so, signs to look for healthy skin and coat so um 
we would typically be looking for uh, dogs and cats that have a fully haired coat. So if there's patches of hair missing or alopecia, then that is considered abnormal. Um, If there's any inflammatory changes to the skin, so we can see um, increased redness of the skin. Um, We can see symptoms of infection on the skin. So the skin might look scaly or some people will often say their dog looks dandruffy. Um, We might see uh, papules or pustules, so pimple type lesions, Um, or we can see crusting lesions and all of those would be considered to be abnormal got it okay and and i guess what what should i be doing as far as watching out for these things with my pet is it just looking out for those symptoms like scratching and itching and licking your paws yeah, absolutely. So I would say, you know, with my Labrador tribe, um, yeah. we have uh, tribe. <laughs> two, two Labradors that have allergies and um, these Labradors used to be my patients that um, yes. were adopted by our family. And we have one Labrador that is completely normal, no symptoms of allergy whatsoever. And when I think of my normal Labrador, I rarely see him lick, chew, bite, scratch or rub. Um, when I think of my dogs that are affected by allergy, they have a noticeable level of licking. They have a noticeable level of scratching. So if you're noticing any of those behaviours, it's probably abnormal. Um, And we can certainly see some pets displaying quite severe behaviours. So you'll see pets that are going on walks and they have to stop to chew it themselves or stop to scratch. Um, So I think that um, as these uh, types of things progress, the symptoms become more noticeable over time. Hmm. So I think one of the things that I always sort of think about is, as you said, you've got that sort of symptomatic presentation and then and then the immediate steps that you take. So in, in a veterinary context, what, what would you do first? Because I think you've got that kind of symptomatic resolution, give the dog some relief or the cat some relief, and then hopefully start to address some of the root cause issues as well. And, and, yeah. skin, and skin and coat, that sort of nexus between skin, coat, allergy, gut health, immune health, inflammation it's a fairly complex set of circumstances isn't it and it, and as you, as you sort of alluded to it's very individualized Absolutely. So I guess if we're um, talking about dogs in the first instance, yeah. because they're quite different to cats. Um, if we see an itchy dog coming into the clinic, and this could be in a general practice or a referral setting, um, one of the first things we'll do is make sure the dog is on appropriate uh, parasiticide control, particularly flea and tick control. Got um, it. So actually one of the most common causes of itching in dogs is flea allergy dermatitis. So okay. this does not require the dog to be coated in fleas, um, even a small number number of fleas can cause a severe allergic response in a susceptible individual. Um, and so typically we're recommending um, oral flea and tick preventatives that kill fleas very quickly. Um, and then we see less incidence of flea allergy dermatitis. Is it the fleas themselves or the flea larvae? Uh, so it's the fleas themselves and it's actually okay. the flea saliva that's triggering the allergic response. Oh, interesting. And, um, you know, I always say that if you see one flea, there are many, many more fleas. Um, that you haven't you seen. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. So really for every dog um, uh, that lives in Australia, we should be giving uh, year-round flea prevention. Yep. Um, and that's certainly our clinic's recommendation. Um, now, if the patient is already on fabulous flea prevention and we're not seeing any evidence of a flea infestation, um, then there are other types of things that can potentially cause itching. Um, so Sometimes we see a dermatophyte, which is a fungal infection, commonly called yep. ringworm, that can contribute yes. to um, itching in dogs. Yep. Um, we can also see allergic skin diseases that can tri- contribute to itching in dogs. So we can see food allergies, and typically dogs are allergic to things we commonly feed them, like beef, chicken, wheat, dairy, soy, pork, fish, yep. lamb, yep. all the things that are common in pet food. <laughs> yep. Um, And then the other type of allergy that we see, and this is probably the most common type of allergy that we manage in our practice, is an environmental allergy. So allergies to weeds and trees and grasses and insects, similar to the types of things that cause hay fever in people. Um, And I guess less commonly these days, we can also see other types of ectoparasites like mites um, causing itchy skin disease. But um, our flea and tick preventatives are so fabulous at killing so many things that um, for the most part, things like psychoptic mange or um, demodicosis which are um, mites that can affect dogs, um, we very rarely see in practice. We don't see it anymore, do we? 
Absolutely. When I was first in dermatology, it used to be, gosh, probably 10 cases a week, at least of mites. Yep. Um, we never see them. And so when we do see mites in practice now, and it might be once every other year, it's really exciting for us because <laughs> it's almost something that we just see in textbooks these days. And um, one of the things I really love about mites is that we can cure these dogs so easily. So yep. it's such a great diagnosis when we do have them. Well, it's very binary with, with skin disease a lot of the time with dogs, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's either a dog who's in severe distress and and then you can give them some resolution and they feel fantastic, which is, I guess, very rewarding. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really quite interesting because I think that sometimes we underestimate how significant skin disease can be and what a quality yep. of life issue it is for pets. And um, there's a really good association between um, skin disease and behavioural issues in pets. Um, okay. And we certainly have patients that come into the practice. They can be quite cranky with us. Um, they can often be a little bit aggressive. And um, sometimes it's just because they are absolutely miserable. Their ears are sore, they're itchy. And once we manage those components, their behaviour can improve dramatically yep no absolutely and i think there's this again this connection with ear health as well right from a skin point of view yeah, absolutely. So when we're seeing dogs that are developing um, ear infections, most commonly it's going to be triggered by um, an underlying allergic process, although there's lots of other causes of ear disease as well. So in summer, we can see foreign bodies like grass seeds um, yep. contributing to ear disease. Um, we can also see mites contributing to ear disease. We can see um, little tumours or polyps that contribute to ear disease, um, or we can see an underlying allergic trigger that's causing our ear problems. Yeah, it, it's complex. It's, I guess that's what makes your job so fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things to note too is that most dogs that have skin disease um, will develop an ear infection at some point throughout their life. Um, in fact, as an example, 80% of food allergic dogs will have a ear infection at some point throughout their life. Probably somewhere between 40 and 60% of dogs with those environmental allergies will also have concurrent ear disease. And is that, what, what's behind that, do you think, that correlation? Uh, so we think of the ears as a continuum of the skin. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. So similar process in both sites. Got it. Okay. So let's let's double click if we can on food. So um, we're a little bit agnostic when it comes to food. I mean, I think we've had people on the on the show who advocate raw. We've had some who say that complete and balance is the only way to go. We don't really advocate a position, um, and that that's just because I know pet parents want to make personal decisions around that, but. I mean, you've, you've raised that there are a number of allergens just in, in very common things that we feed our pets. What, what do you advocate as, what do you recommend as a diet? Yeah, so um, I would say in general, um, food allergies are exceptionally overdiagnosed. Um, usually, oh, is that right? by, okay. yeah. So, I okay. mean, I think that, that a lot of the time um, when we see pets, um, a, a pet parent will come in and they'll give us a list of 50 different things that they think their pet might be allergic to. Um, yep. And the reality is they might not be allergic to any of them. Um, yep. And we need to go through a process to figure that out. So when we do suspect a food allergy, and we might suspect a food allergy because a patient has uh, gastrointestinal disease. So maybe they have um, more than three bowel motions a day, or maybe yep. there's um, a change to the type of bowel motion that they have and maybe they also have concurrent skin and ear disease so they're itchy they get ear infections and so we might recommend um, trying to rule out a food allergy so when we're ruling out a food allergy we're trying to find a diet that does not contain those offending allergens that i mentioned previously um, yeah. and typically we cannot find those diets over the counter no. so depending on the age and the breed and the size of the dog we might recommend doing a home cooked diet. Um, we do need to be a little bit careful when we're doing home cooked diets. Um, for example, if a dog is less than 12 months of age, we need yep. to make sure that diet is appropriately balanced. Or if it's a giant breed dog, we might need to make sure that diet is appropriate uh, appropriately balanced for a longer period of time. Um, and home cooked diets are quite hard work. So we're usually are, asking yeah. people to find a novel protein. So a novel protein might look like goat or it might be rabbit, um, something yep. the pet has been unlikely to be exposed to before in conjunction with a carbohydrate such as sweet potato. Um, yep. And we're asking people to feed these diets for quite extended periods of time. Um, and so if you have an 86 kilo Great Dane and we're asking you to feed <laughs> 
rabbit and sweet potato for a lot months of on end. That's a lot of rabbits. It's a lot of sweet potato. Um, so it's a big commitment. Um, and so the other way that we can rule out food allergies is to do prescription dietary trials. So Royal Cannon, um, Hills, yep. uh, Purina all make prescription foods that um, veterinarians often recommend to do these dietary trials. And these diets are specifically formulated for food allergic dogs. Um, and that's often the easier route to go down. Yeah, I mean, I mean, home feeding, it's, a, it's an incredible aspiration, but I think it almost requires someone to be at home full time to, to manage it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've got some really dedicated pet parents who are really enthusiastic about doing home cooked diets. But if you ask me to do a home cooked diet with our household full of pets and three yep. kids and work, there's just no way that I would be able no. to do it. No. Um, and so I guess that, um, you know, commitment from the pet parent is um, one part of the equation as well, because I think the hardest thing we ever ask our pet parents to do is a dietary trial. Yep. I mean, I would struggle to do that in our house as our 18 month old throws bolognese over the walls and the labradors <laughs> is straight over there to clean it up so it is a really <laughs> tough ask so what about just general so so putting aside the food the, the potentially food allergic animal what's a what's a, a skin healthy diet that one that that general general animals should be thinking about yeah, so um, I'm a big supporter of complete and balanced diets. And I yep. think that if we're, um, you know, if we have a healthy dog that doesn't have any skin concerns, um, then any of our, um, you know, complete and balanced diets are going to contain a good ratio of omegas um, that are going to support good skin health. Um, typically, we would only recommend diets specific for skin disease if the dog has a skin concern. So if they yep. have a food allergy, we might recommend doing a hypoallergenic diet. Um, if they have an environmental allergy, um, there are uh, diets that are specifically formulated for dogs that have environmental allergies that have increased numbers of omegas um, and other components that help to support skin health, like Royal Cannon Skin Support or yep. um, Hills Derm Defense or Derm Complete. With with environmental allergies, how do you, how do you diagnose those? How do you figure? Because it's going to be more than likely it's going to be one or more triggers, right? Yeah, that's right. So typically it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So firstly, yes. we want to exclude ectoparasites and fleas by making yep. sure the pet's on appropriate flea control. Uh, next, we want to exclude food allergies. So we're often asking our parents to do a dietary trial. And okay. then once we've excluded those things, we might come to a clinical diagnosis of environmental allergy. Um, and that part's quite important because it's very difficult clinically to tell the difference between a food allergy and environmental allergy because they right present the same way. Um, the only way we might be able to tell them apart clinically is if there's a seasonality. So say, for example, the pet is only itchy in spring and summer, yep. well, then it's obviously not a food allergy. It's an environmental allergy. But for our pets that are itchy year round, which is the vast majority of pets, um, then we need to rule out a food allergy first. Once we've done that and we've made a clinical diagnosis of an environmental allergy, then we yep. can consider doing allergy testing. Um, so we allergy test pets in a similar way to uh, how we allergy test people. So yep. we do an intradermal prick test on the skin. Yep. We can also take a blood sample. Um, and these tests are looking for things in the environment that these pets are allergic to. Um, once we've identified what they're allergic to, then we can create a serum to desensitize these pets. Okay. And the serum is, is, is that almost like a, re a remedy specifically for that particular al allergen? Yeah, that's exactly right. So as an example, on our intradermal allergy testing, we're testing for 69 different allergens. So it's a wow. lot of needles for a pet. Um, they, wow. are lo they are nice and sedated during this procedure. So it's yep. very minimally invasive and the pets are comfortable. But we're injecting all sorts of different grasses, weeds, trees, insects, dust mites, molds, etc. And what we're looking for on the skin is um, a little swelling or a hive that might- Some sort of inflammatory that. response. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. And so then once we've got our information about what the pet's allergic to, it's very difficult for pets to avoid these things because yep. they're everywhere in the environment. And we want pets to be able to live their best lives and go to the park and do all the things that they would normally do. And so the better strategy is to desensitize them. So the serum contains the things that the pet's allergic to. So as an okay. example, if the pet tested allergic to uh, eucalyptus trees and dust yep. mites and paspalum grass, then we would 
would add those things to a serum that's given via injection. And we normally teach our pet parents how to administer those injections at home. Okay. We have these pets on these injections over a course of at least 18 months, and then we reevaluate their progress. Um, and the vast majority of pets will have a positive response to that therapy. And the premise with that serum therapy is to develop the pet's own antibodies or... Uh, own tolerance. So, own tolerance. Um, you okay. know, how I try and um, explain it to um, pet parents is, um, you know, when the pet's out in the environment, they're exposed to all of these things naturally. And unfortunately, the immune system is perceiving, for example, the eucalyptus allergen as a threat. So it mounts an inflammatory response. Um, yep. And then the pet becomes itchy. And then we can go on to develop secondary infections. Um, but if we expose the pet to low doses of these things over a period of time, then we can shift the immune response. Um, and so the whole Hope is that the pet no longer reacts to those things um, in the same way after the desensitization process. Yeah, no, got it. And what? So, so that's that's a fantastic summary, I think, of of the diagnostic process. What about the treatment process? So, where where do you start? So, we've talked about serums, um, steroidal creams. You, you know, I think that there's a lot of different topical solutions out there. But we also, in our industry anyway, we think about okay, how can we help support the gut function in the pet? Yeah, so I guess there's not a lot of good um, uh, data looking at uh, gut function, gut health and environmental allergies and if there's any correlation there um, or, or if there would be any benefit from um, supporting gut health. Mm. Um However, when we're managing these dogs with environmental allergies, it is very much a multimodal approach. So it's not yep. a simple matter of just doing one thing. Usually we're covering a few different areas. So for example, um, we know these dogs with environmental allergies inherently have a drier coat. And so what can we do to help ah, moisturize um, this okay. coat and improve skin health that way? And there's okay. a couple of different ways that we can do that. So one way that we can do that is through oral supplementation. So yep. um, we can feed diets that are specifically formulated for pets with environmental allergies um, or we might potentially use a nutritional supplement that contains a great ratio of um, omega oils. Um, the other way that we might do it is topically. So there are topical fatty acids and essential oils yes. and there are topical moisturizers that we can use. So some examples of that, um, there's a product called uh, Dermacent Essential 6, which is available yep. over the counter, contains essential oils and fatty acids and it's, applied as, a, yeah, it's applied as a spot on once a week. And that can be quite helpful at mm. um, helping to restore moisture balance in the coat. Um, we also like to use conditioners, for example, poor Nutriderm conditioner, um, which can also be uh, quite helpful at moisturizing the coat. And sometimes improving the moisture balance um, will help to decrease the itching for that pet as well. So that's one area that we cover. Another area that we cover is how are we going to stop this pet from itching? Because yep. really that's what the pet parent is most concerned about. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're really lucky. So when I started being a vet, and this will absolutely date me now, um, <laughs> really all we had as an option was steroids. So that yep. was as good as it got. So oral steroids, topical steroids, you didn't really have any other choices. Um, but now we're really lucky to have um, monoclonal antibodies that can be given as an injection to stop itching. Um, we've got more sophisticated and safer oral medications that can be given to stop itching. Um, and I guess the reason that we've got more than one option is because not every medication is going to help every pet. No, so we're course. lucky that we can select from those different options when needed. Um, another big component of managing these dogs is they almost always inevitably have some component of secondary infection. So as they're licking their skin or as they're scratching, uh, they're damaging the surface of that skin and disrupting that skin barrier. Um, and we know that that contributes to both bacterial and yeast infections for our pets. Um, and so how do we manage that infection? Sometimes we do that topically. So we might yep. use a medicated shampoo like Maliseb, which is also yep. available over the counter. Um, or we might choose to use oral medications like antibiotics and antifungals, depending on the severity of the skin disease. Um, and so I think initially when we're seeing a pet and we're trying to formulate a plan to keep them comfortable, our plan looks at um, supporting the skin barrier and helping to moisturize the coat. We look at how we're going to stop the pet from itching. And then yep. we also look at um, how we're going to manage any secondary infections. Um, so usually um, the first visit with a vet for skin disease, whether it's a GP vet or a specialist vet, there's going to be a lot that's recommended. Yes. Um, but over time, as the pet improves, um, there's a whole lot less that is required. Yeah, no, I, I get it. And uh, we, I used to run the pure animal wellbeing business. So I know the Nutriderm shampoo really well. It's a beautiful product. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we usually um, ask our pet parents, so you can use it as a conditioner and that's great. Um, Or we can um, mix the conditioner with some water in a spray bottle and do it as like a leave-in conditioner, um, which we commonly recommend as well. We used to use it ourselves on our hair. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Well, you do have great hair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) It's it's actually a really good product. Um, So so that's actually a reasonable segue. So shampooing and washing, healthy dog, non-itchy dog, what should what should the the average pet parent do with with you know pretty pretty average sort of healthy dog or cat? It's a really good question, and you know it's funny that you ask that because almost every day in consultation, I will say, "How often are you washing your dog?" Yeah, um, and people are almost scared to answer the question because everyone's been told something different about what's appropriate as far as frequency. There's goes. definitely schools of thought out there, isn't there, in terms of Absolutely. you know wash them once a week, don't wash them at all. Where, yeah, where do you so, stand? Um, I think we can apply a general rule, um, but before I go into that, I think I would say that every patient's going to be different. So I have some patients that absolutely are worse when they're baked. Um, Now, that is the minority of my patients, um, but I have patients that whether they get wet or whether they get bathed with a hypoallergenic shampoo or a medicated shampoo, it just does not help them. In fact, it makes them worse. Um, However, the vast majority of pets will improve with bathing. Now, for a normal dog that does not have have any history of skin disease, how often should we bathe them? I would say when they stink. So okay. <laughs> for my dogs, um, my Labradors, that is at least once a week. Um, yep. We live on a farm. They love rolling in poo, particularly rabbit poo, and they still constantly. So I yep. bath them weekly. They tolerate that. Um, and that's the way they're allowed inside my home. Um, <laughs> however, I've got some clients who have lovely oodly type dogs that live in apartments and they might get baths, you know, once every six months months um yep. and that's going to work really well for them so for normal dogs it's as frequently as you need to based on how they smell based on you. the smell factor okay absolutely or, <laughs> or when they get dirty yeah. um for dogs with skin disease um so when they have an active infection we often recommend very frequent bathing so we might recommend bathing three times a week with a medicated okay. shampoo when they have active skin disease um when they are stable we often still recommend more regular bathing for these patients so typically typically once per week. There is evidence to show that if we're bathing these pets once per week, we're helping to manage their allergies because we're number one, removing allergens. We know that allergens can accumulate on a pet's coat. So if we're bathing them weekly, we're helping to remove them. Um, And depending on the patient, if we're bathing with an antibacterial or antifungal shampoo, we're also helping to reduce the resident numbers of bacteria and yeast that live on the skin and decreasing our susceptibility to infection. So typically for our allergic dogs, we recommend weekly bathing. Okay. And anything to watch out for with shampoos and conditioners? Is there any particular, you know, SLS and these kind of ingredients that we hear about in human shampoos to be concerned about? Um, Not necessarily. The only thing that I would say is that, um, you know, topical reactions are certainly possible with absolutely any product. So I'm sure in everyone's lifetime, they've all had a cream or a lotion or something they've put on their skin and they've thought, gosh, that's made my skin instantly much worse. Or sometimes it might be worse after 24 hours. That could be a contact or a topical reaction. Um, And so if the pet's skin looks worse after the application of the shampoo, um, then I would be suspicious that we were having a topical reaction. Um, and so in those instances, we'd recommend not using that product going forward. Um, with our veterinary shampoos, um, particularly the medicated ones, um, I would always recommend wearing gloves. None of the products are ah, particularly, okay. yeah, so none of the products are particularly, um, you know, contact irritant or toxic or anything like that um, as far as things like Maliseb go. However, I always think, I don't have a skin infection. I don't need no. to be contacting the active ingredients of that shampoo. So best to so wear just gloves. Wear gloves. Yeah, it makes sense. Absolutely. So I always wear gloves when we're bathing our pets. And um, certainly some of these medicated shampoos can be a little bit irritating if they get in eyes or places yes, like that. Absolutely. So, Um, When we're asking our clients to bathe their pets, we always say to them from the neck down, we don't ever ask them to bathe the face. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so how do you keep the, the face clean? Just just with a, a washcloth and water or? Yeah. So, you know, the easiest and cheapest way to do it is to use something like an unscented baby wipe. So yep. I love the, you know, um, baby wipes from Woolworths, the little ones, unscented. Yep. You can wipe the face every day if you need to. And, um, you know, that's also really good for all of our little smushy face dogs um, that have the yeah. folds that need to have a little Absolutely. clean out. So whether it's their facial folds or their tail folds or anything like that, um, we often recommend recommend for those owners to be wiping those areas on a daily basis got it okay that's a really that's a really good summary cats now we spent as always we spent a lot of time talking about dogs <laughs> what do you see in cats what sort of issues do you see with your cat patients it's a great question so um, what i would say about cats is um even though i have way too many dogs and actually from your list that you gave before you forgot my Frenchie Lola oh no so, um, oh sorry my Lola they're just multiplying <laughs> they're everywhere um and so um, what's your I limit would... or what's what's your husband's limit <laughs> you know what I'm not sure that he has one and I'm so thankful okay. for that <laughs> okay he sounds like a great guy <laughs> <laughs> he's amazing um so um I guess with cats I'm absolutely a cat person and I love them um yep. but as a vet Gosh, they're challenging because yep. for the most part, our pet parents can give a dog medications orally. Let's face it, most of the time we can hide it in something delicious. Totally. Um, or and the dog just the dog just wolfs it down and doesn't really give you too much trouble. Exactly. Absolutely. Or we can put a cream or a lotion on them and we're not, you know, taking our own lives into our hands. Um, but we go to a cat and all of a sudden, you know, we can't give them liquids, we can't give them tablets, we can't yeah. put a cream on, we can't do a lotion. So cats are really challenging for vets to manage. Um, and so I guess when we see cats coming in for skin disease in particular, um, they're often coming in because they're itchy. Um, yeah. In cats, mites are actually much more common than they are in dogs, at least in ah. our practice. And so... Um, um, our first port of call is always making sure the cat is on appropriate flea and mite control. There are numerous okay. different types of mites that cats can become affected with. Um, the next thing we see in cats that can cause skin disease is ringworm. And ringworm is much more common in cats than it is in dogs. Um, and so we always screen our cats to check them for ringworm when they present to us with itchy skin disease. Got it. Um, and then the next thing we see cats for is allergies. So similar to dogs, we can see cats that have flea allergies. We can see cats that have food allergies and we can see cats that have environmental allergies. Okay. So it's the um, same categories. You got it. But I think mm. that there are a few things that are a little bit different. So, you okay. know, firstly mites in cats and then secondly ringworm. Um, the other thing about food allergies in cats is trying to get a cat to eat a hypoallergenic diet is ridiculously hard. Trying to get them to eat anything except lucky cat, you know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly right. And so, you know, sometimes what we have to do is get a little bit creative and often yep. for our cats we're getting our owners to garnish the hypoallergenic dry food with a little bit of cooked goat meat or a little bit of cooked venison or right. something to get that cat interested in eating that food um, and then following on from that when we've ruled out a food allergy we're left with environmental allergies and we can yep. also allergy test and desensitize cats um, so the same cats process as for dogs you got it. Um, okay. Although cats actually respond really well. So we see about an 86% response, uh, response rate with cats in our clinic, which is oh. um, the highest of the domestic species that we desensitize in our practice. So they do very well. Um, as far as how we manage these cats when they're yeah. itchy. Well, this is, um, this is my, my question for you. <laughs> yeah. So we can certainly um, sometimes try things like antihistamines. And I didn't mention antihistamines when we were talking about dogs, because honestly, I just don't find them effective. But oh, I do find the odd cat that responds reasonably well to um, antihistamines. Um, the other thing that we can sometimes um, uh, use in cats, and this is is probably the mainstay of our anti-itch therapy is steroids. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's pretty um, sad in the sense that um, cats are a relatively small market for a lot of our pharmaceutical companies. So um, unfortunately in cats, we just don't have the same options available that we do in dogs. So Got it. Um, we're really limited to steroids. And then there's um, another medication um, uh, that we can use, uh, which comes as a liquid. It also suppresses the immune system um, that can be used in cats for itching. And those are our really our two only options. So there's um, not the, the there's not the likes of the monoclonal the, the monoclonal no, for the cats. No, at least not yet. But we can all. It's going to change. I think. I mean, the the, the percentage of cat ownership, you know, relative to dog, dog dog ownership, is just incredible as far as the growth rate. So 
It'll definitely yeah, change. Yeah, absolutely. Cats are, as um, so we have a beautiful dermatologist that also works in our practice calls, Callum, and I always hear him say cats are the superior species. Um, <laughs> so he's also very much a cat person. <laughs> Um, one thing I also really love doing um, is, uh, you know, when people are able to is topical therapies in cats. So, yes. you know, topical steroids can be quite helpful in cats. Now, of course, the biggest barrier is stopping them from licking them off. So, yeah. So what, what, is, um, what does a pet parent do in that instance? Well, you've got to get creative. So, yeah. um, you know, I think there's a few different ways that you can um, manage this. So um, with my cats, and I'm going to sound quite crazy right now, but um, we have uh, some videos that are saved to our YouTube channel for cats. Um, uh. And we put those on our TV. And usually the cats are lunging at the TV, trying to grab the fish or trying to grab the piece of string or whatever Love else. It. So um, if you've got a cat that likes play, if you Less Google uh, absolutely cat videos, yeah. you can find things on YouTube. <laughs> um, and then the other thing, you can do if you've got a cat that likes food that's a really good time to feed them after you've applied something topically right um if you've got a cat that likes to cuddle that's a great time to cuddle them um you know as a last resort sometimes we ask owners to put an elizabethan collar on the cat yes. for 10 minutes after application and we want to try and avoid doing that because that's not something the cat's going to be particularly happy about no. um however if distraction fails that is our last resort got it got it uh, we spoke a little bit about the, the the gut and the immune system previously. What, in in your understanding, and, and I guess in clinical practice, is what's the link that you're finding between, say, the microbiome? Because this is an emergent area of science, I think, particularly with respect to the immune system and so on. Is is there a link that you see? I mean, for me, I guess it's it's, it's illustrated in this this sort of deep individual individualization of your treatment process. Yeah, so I guess that, um, you know, as at the, as we currently stand, there's not a large amount of data on the link between the gut microbiome um, and skin disease. So specifically for skin disease in uh, veterinary medicine, um, yep. we don't typically recommend any gut interventions. Got it. However, um, I think that if pet parents are interested in supplementing their pets with things like probiotics, then um, I certainly don't think that they're harmful. Mm. No, and, and I think some people certainly in our experience get some great results with probably the more easy to treat conditions. Yeah, and there certainly are some um, pet parents and we have some clients that routinely give supplements like probiotics that um, and their pets derive benefits from those things um, and that's certainly fine for them to continue. However, usually by the time a pet makes it to a specialist, um, they need more um, multimodal management to get the skin disease under control. Absolutely, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, thank you. I think we're coming up to the end of the um, to the end of this hour. But you know, thank you very much for your time. I want to, if I can, ask for your five top tips for dogs and for cats for healthy skin. Five top tips. Wow. Okay. Um, so <laughs> put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so this is just for healthy dogs and for healthy generally cats? healthy dogs. Yep. Great. And cats. So. Excellent. So five top tips for dogs. Number one, feed them a great quality diet. So yep. um, talk to your vet about the diet that they would recommend. Um, your vet's always a great place to start. Um, number two, um, bathing pets. So I think that bathing pets is quite helpful to remove dander, to improve odour, et cetera, and bathing frequency should be dictated um, based on the odour and cleanliness status of the pet in a normal as we, pet. As we were saying, yep. Yeah. Um, and then number three, um, brushing pets. So I know that sounds really obvious, but okay. we have a lot of dogs that come in that um, I'm not sure they've seen a brush in a little while. So um, I think, you know, making sure you brush your pets, particularly if they do have those medium or longer coats. is Any um, particular absolute. type of brush or anything's okay? Yeah, so I think that um, brushes like the Ferminator type brushes yeah. or the ones that really strip those undercoats can sometimes be a little bit harsh. Um, I use, um, I, I don't use a pet brush for my pets. I use my um, old hairbrush, not the one okay. I currently use. Um, okay. And um, that's quite gentle. Although I have Labradors and I do appreciate for those longer head dogs, people might prefer a different type of brush. Um, and then moisturizing the coat is also helpful. So we spoke before about things like poor Nutriderm um, conditioner being helpful or the Dermacent. Maybe as a spray, yep. Yeah, or the Dermacent Essential 6 pipettes. Yep. Um, and gosh, I don't know if I'm going to make it to five. I think that <laughs> might be um, my Four's top good. four. Four is um, really good. And then I guess moving on to kitty cats, it's 
it's quite similar. So making sure they have a complete and balanced diet. Um, yep. And there's so many different ways that you can do that these days. Like there's great companies that are doing, um, you know, home cooked meals that are complete and balanced, or you can choose to do a dry food preparation if that's your preference. Um, and then cats are a little bit different um, in the sense that a lot of cats do require a brush, but it becomes a lot harder in cats because they've Absolutely. got sharp claws and teeth. <laughs> um, so making sure we start brushing them from an early age. Um, and Get them then used to it. Yeah, absolutely. And then Dermascent Essential Six for Pets. Um, there's also a cat version as well. So moisturizing the coat of these cats too. Um, and some cats love a bath. So out of our cats, we have two really? that love baths. So why not? Yep, absolutely. So I um, haven't I think- experienced that yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so if your cat likes a bath there's absolutely no reason that they can't have one okay brilliant thank you very much that's amazing sorry i only got to four for cats as well uh, <laughs> the the four are good the four are really good well dr danny thank you so much for your time it's been an absolute pleasure having you on today thanks for having me i really appreciate it you're more than welcome and, and have a great time in hobart yeah thanks so much have a good one thanks Danny. bye <laughs>